For a wound to heal properly, it must complete three stages of healing, inflammation, proliferation, and maturation. The inflammatory stage has two phases. The first phase, vasoconstriction, occurs immediately after the injury. Vasoconstriction serves to stop the bleeding and create a temporary seal blocking bacteria from entering the wound by creating a fibrin clot. The second phase of the inflammatory stage is vasodilation. This occurs during the first week after injury. When blood vessels dilate, they bring in white blood cells to attack any bacteria that has contaminated the wound. Dead cells, dead bacteria, and any debris is then removed from the wound by a process called phagocytosis. This process results in swelling and pus formation. The original injury and phagocytosis results in a defect that must be filled. This brings us to the second stage of wound healing. During the first part of the proliferative stage, granulation tissue fills in the void. This occurs during the first one to four weeks post-injury. Granulation tissue is highly vascular, weak, disorganized collagen. Once the defect has filled in with granulation tissue, the second phase of the proliferative stage begins, epithelialization. During this phase, skin cells grow across the surface of the granulation bed. This animation demonstrates a wound filling in with granulation tissue prior to the advancement of skin cells across the surface of the granulation bed. This photograph is an example of a healthy granulation bed. This image shows a wound that has completely granulated and new epithelial cells are beginning to migrate across the surface of the granulation bed. The final stage of healing is the maturation stage. This stage starts at three weeks and can continue on for the first two years after the injury occurs. During this stage, the wound contracts and the disorganized collagen becomes more linear and strong. The resulting scar, however, will only be 80% as strong as the original skin was. The horse in this image was hit by a truck and there was no viable skin left to suture. The photo on the left shows the wound after a healthy granulation bed had established. The picture on the right shows the wound once it is starting to contract. These photos demonstrate a severe wound going through the stages of wound healing. The photo on the left shows the wound after it went through the inflammatory phase. The second photo details the wound after it was debrided and sutured. The third photo was taken at three weeks and shows a healthy granulation bed. By five weeks, epithelialization was occurring, and by 12 weeks, the wound had contracted significantly. Horses' lower limbs are particularly prone to a problem called proud flesh. Proud flesh is also known as exuberant granulation tissue and is an overgrowth of the normal granulation tissue. Unfortunately, this tissue extends beyond the skin margins and the epithelium is unable to grow fast enough to enclose the wound. Proud flesh develops on the lower limbs when there is excess motion, friction, or infection. Wounds over joints are particularly prone to proud flesh because of the motion of the joint. Friction across the granulation bed can occur with unnecessary or overly frequent cleaning of the wound or from a poorly applied bandage that slips and slides on the surface of the wound. This animation demonstrates how the skin cells are not able to grow across the surface of the granulation bed 
because the granulation bed is growing faster than the skin cells. This results in the three-dimensional pink cauliflower appearance of proud flesh, extending beyond the wound margins. There are three basic ways to accelerate wound healing. Number one is to clean and debride the wound. This reduces the length of the inflammatory phase of healing. The second way to accelerate wound healing is to suture the wound closed if possible. By closing the wound, there is a reduced need for epithelialization and contraction. The third way to accelerate wound healing is to bandage the wound. This reduces inflammation and pain associated with swelling, and it creates an ideal healing environment. Proper bandaging protects the wound and limits mobility of the wound, thereby reducing proud flesh. When cleaning a wound, it is important to remember that you should only put on a wound what you would also put into your own eye. The most appropriate cleaning solution is sterile saline with or without dilute betadine solution. Water should only be used if saline is not available. While water is helpful to cleanse a wound, it is not isotonic, meaning it can actually damage healthy cells. When cleaning a wound, it is important to try and rinse the debris away and not deeper into the wound. To achieve this, the wound should be irrigated at a 45 degree angle. Never use hydrogen peroxide to clean a wound and never explore a dirty wound until it is completely cleaned as you could risk pushing bacteria deeper into the tissue. Avoid the temptation to apply any sort of coating, spray, or powder to a wound, especially a fresh wound. If a veterinarian is on its way, you have done more harm than good, and the veterinarian will have to remove any of this product you applied to the wound prior to being able to suture it closed. A heavily contaminated or necrotic wound should be debrided and cleaned by a veterinarian. This wound was four days old prior to receiving veterinary attention. All the necrotic tissue, fly eggs, and dirt needed to be removed prior to the wound being able to be sutured. But by then, the wound margins had contracted and dried out to the point that the wound was not able to be completely closed. Anytime a wound is located over a joint, especially in the lower limbs, the horse should immediately be evaluated by a veterinarian before any wound treatment occurs. Whenever possible, the best thing for a wound is to suture it closed. Skin acts as a biological band-aid. Sometimes after trauma, the wound margins are compromised and the sutures may fail after a few days or a week. Even if this occurs, the wound is more likely to heal more rapidly than if it had not been sutured at all. The final step in accelerating wound healing is to apply a bandage to protect the wound. Most bandages are applied in three layers, a primary layer that contacts the wound, a secondary absorbent layer, and a tertiary outer layer. The primary layer of the bandage is the layer directly against the wound. This layer can be adherent or non-adherent. Any type of wound dressing is an example of a primary layer. When selecting a wound dressing, remember that anything you put on the wound changes the wound environment, and the wound environment can either promote or discourage healing. The stage of healing of the wound dictates which type of dressing should be selected. Most ointments actually interfere with normal healing process by either overstimulating granulation tissue or by delaying epithelialization and contracture of the wound. There are four basic categories of wound dressings, debridement dressings, moistening dressings, granulation and wound contraction dressings, and epithelialization dressings. Debridement dressings assist the wound by removing necrotic material and bacteria from the surface of the wound. They should only be used when infected or dead tissue is present, as they will indiscriminately remove the top layer of the wound. If the wound bed is healthy, it will remove these healthy cells. These bandages must be changed frequently because of the amount of discharge of the wound. 
Once necrotic tissue and bacteria has been removed, this type of bandage should be discontinued. An example of a debridement dressing is hypertonic saline dressing, such as curasol. This next category of dressings serve to moisten a wound that has become dried out. These style of dressings completely seal the wound and are therefore termed occlusive. Once the wound is sufficiently moist, these type of bandages should be discontinued. An example of a moistening dressing is Curafil or Cura Gel, which is an amorphous gel containing water and glycerin. The third category of wound dressings promote granulation and contraction of the wound. By absorbing excess exudate but maintaining wound moisture, this style of dressing stimulates white blood cells to migrate to the site of injury and assist with healing. Examples of this type of bandage are calcium alginate dressings, which are seaweed derivatives. Curasorb is a type of this bandage. Once the wound has a healthy granulation bed, this type of dressing should no longer be used. The final category of wound dressings stimulates epithelialization by increasing the surface temperature of the wound. This encourages skin cells to migrate from the margins across the healthy granulation bed. These types of dressings are usually made out of semi-occlusive foam. Hopefully by now you're realizing managing a wound is more complicated than just smearing on whatever ointment is lying around. After the primary layer of the bandage has been applied, the secondary layer is added. This layer provides padding and absorption and support for the limb while restricting mobility. Examples of secondary padding include cast padding, roll cotton, combine rolls, quilts, and nobos. The tertiary layer of a bandage is the final layer and holds all the other layers in place. This layer applies pressure and protects the wound from the environment. Vet wrap and elasticon are examples of tertiary bandages. Nylon track wraps are also tertiary bandages. It is important to know the difference between nylon track wraps and fleece polo wraps. While they may look the same, fleece polo wraps are made out of fleece and are therefore soft and squishy. These wraps are designed to protect the horse's lower limb from the accidental impact of a polo mallet. Polo wraps are not supportive and therefore should not be used as a tertiary layer. The following video demonstrates how to put the secondary and tertiary layers on a horse's lower limb. This horse did not have a wound on the lower leg, so a primary layer was not used before the application of the secondary layer. So we're going to start by bandaging her lower leg to try and help push the fluid back up into circulation. These are quilted cotton wraps. Uh, this particular brand is called a Nobo because it doesn't bow the tendons in the leg. So how you want to wrap it is you follow the direction of the tendons. So on the left front, you're going to wrap from outside in, so counterclockwise. On the right side of the body, you would wrap the opposite direction, you'd be wrapping um, clockwise. So I start with the wrap on the inside point of her leg, and you're wrapping from knee to about mid-pastern. I'm laying it nice and smooth, and I'm pulling it just tight enough that it lays flat. And think of it like wearing your socks. You don't want them all bunched up inside your shoe because it's uncomfortable. So the wrap's on nice and smooth. Then I use this, which is called nylon track wrap. You can either start over the top or some people will tuck the wrap in to help kind of hold it in place. And this is where it requires a little bit of dexterity and practice makes perfect because sometimes you'll end up dropping the wrap if you're not that familiar with how to do it. Ooh. But you start from the middle and wrap down the leg first. And the goal is your wrap should cover half of the previous wrap. So I'm going 50%. And I'm pulling it pretty snug, okay? Now you have to be careful that you don't bow a tendon in a horse's leg by pulling things too tight. But as long as you have a squishy cotton wrap underneath this non-stretchy wrap, you're not going it's, it's not very easy to get it too tight. 
So now I'm, I went down below the pastern for a little bit of support. And I'm coming back up the leg, covering my wrap about 50% each time. That figure somewhat depends on the length of your horse's cannon bone. I wrap all the way up to the top. You don't want the wrap going over because then it'll curl in and rub on the hairline. So you want the wrap, a little bit of your, your cotton wrap to stick out at the top and the bottom. And just making sure it's nice and smooth and even the whole time. And by the time we've finished this bandage, the combination of the cotton wrap and the nylon track wrap is called a standing wrap because we use these wraps on horses that are standing around and tend to get swelling in the lower leg. This mare I'm Hopefully by watching this video, you are now more aware and better prepared for dealing with a wound in the future. Thank you for watching. Information on wound management or to enroll in a class to learn how to better care for your horse, please go to our website at www.equi-libriuminstitute.com.